The old main building of Drexel University is a historical monument. It was built in 1891-92, and the architect was the same architect that built John Wanamaker's store downtown. It has the same large court inside. When I came, that court was Drexel's campus. And so uh, the students' only gathering place was in the court. And every fraternity had a certain place on the steps. Every group of students had a certain place on the main floor. Student dances were held on the court. That was Drexel. And uh, the Drexel University we have today were just lines on a piece of paper. This is a, a historical monument. It's, it's a, maybe a national treasure, but at any rate, it's Drexel's treasure, and it's A.J. Drexel's treasure, because he built that building. And, and we are trying to preserve the building, preserve the court, and, and you know, keep it here for another 100 years. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for re-electing me as president for the 21st time. Uh, I trust you'll have a lot of luck and there won't be any more time. <laughs> I thought you would be interested, since we're on the verge of getting our microcomputers and getting a semi-final report from Dr. Sajic on what we're doing and what we've been doing, and he's got some paperwork in here. And if you look on that first page on the faculty development and microcomputing, you can see that uh, our guess is that only the younger faculty would be interested or only the technologically oriented faculty would be interested were totally inappropriate. Uh, all ranks, all colleges took part. Uh, humanities, social science led the way and uh, they're taking the major brunt of introducing students to the microcomputers. The physics labs are being computerized we're doing chemistry demos now, and we will be doing actual hands-on work for the chemistry classes, starting with the arrival of the microbes in the winter. I look forward to it being an absolutely hectic and, I might say, almost frightening year, but it's going to be the most exciting one we've probably ever had. <laughs> Now, in the order of events, it is time for this library to be dedicated. And I quote, Be it resolved that in recognition of 20 years of superb leadership and a two-decade period marked by unparalleled growth academically, physically, and in public repute, we, the Board of Trustees, move that the new university library be named in honor of William Walsh Haggerty. <laughs> Seventh president of Drexel Institute of Technology and first president of Drexel University. Consider, if you will, the library is dedicated. Thank you very much. I have to tell you, I think it's just neat. <laughs> Actually, the library is quite nice. It's beautiful. I sat next to Vince. Again. We'll hit three this time. What do you 
to the second floor. The act of driving a car is no more complicated. In fact, it's simpler today than it was in 1930. Sure. It's the car that's more advanced. That's right. But the same it became more, user, with... became more user friendly. You see. That's right. The same thing's happening with computers. You don't have to They're know getting simpler. More machine design. Sure. You don't have to be able to adjust the spark. I used to have to adjust the spark. The choke, you know. You don't have to do that anymore. When I came here in, uh, I guess, 1980, my preaching to the faculty was largely about demographic decline and what you do to counter it. You either hunker down, shrink the faculty in keeping with the shrinking 18-year-old pool, or you go national. If you go national, you compete against every other first-rate national institution. And you are a newcomer in it. You're just one more of the many. So I, I felt we had to trade on what Drexel had already, that which was unique to us, which means co-op, which means uh, very applied programs built on a solid theoretical base. And those are the things that we could sell. But we were still going off campus to a private vendor to take care of academic computing. And the more you looked at it, the more you realized you could not build strength in what was going to be the area of the next two decades, which is automation, robotics, computer applications to every aspect of the curriculum going off campus. And finally, the thought occurred to me one day that the only way was to have every student have his or her own microcomputer. And that coincided, of course, with the revolution in microcomputer technology which brought the price down to where you could begin to think of doing that. So I went down to Dr. Hagerty with that as part of a list of maybe 10 academic initiatives. I originally had thought that we would probably specify computers for all engineers, all hard scientists like physicists and chemists, and perhaps some other fields, actuarial people, accountants. And I thought the real trick in the microcomputer project would be to introduce the microcomputer into areas where it wouldn't be expected. And humanities and social sciences gave us that kind of opportunity. Everybody went for it. Everybody was excited. And uh, now the next question came out, how will we put wheels under it? My thought was we could get ready for it in 1984. And this was sometime in 82 when I came down and presented it to him. And uh, to tell you that I was just wiped out when the president took one look at it and said, great, we'll do it in 83. Well, <laughs> it was my worst moment, I think, in the three and a half years I've been here because I have a very clear idea of what it would be like uh, to come on board with a totally new program and a degree of preparation that is demanded to do this for the faculty without having done anything to involve the faculty in preparing for it. While there were faculty in every college who were proficient in the use of computers, uh, there were many faculty who were not, especially older ones. And so we had to get a program for giving the faculty experience because they would have to change all their courses. I was concerned really because I thought that the faculty of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences basically wouldn't see a role for themselves in the project. And it turned out that many of the faculty in fact didn't see a role for themselves in the project, some declaring right from the start that they would simply not introduce the microcomputer into their own coursework. And uh, we went back and we told the president, put it off to 84. And fundamentally what he said was, uh, by 84, everybody else will have done it, and you'll be bringing up the end of the parade, and that's not where Drexel wants to be. All right, they pick up their computers here. No, not during distribution. All right, well, how do this is only for service, this area. Right. During, during distribution, they come During distribution, they'll be ushered through the door, right. straight through this way, through these now, doors, right into the Now, first to get in here, do they have to show any ID? To get into that area, they'll have to show ID. Going, you're going to have somebody We're going to have somebody stationed there. there. We, we will have someone stationed there. They don't go fast here unless they show papers they'll have, to they'll show have a receipt, they'll have an ID, they'll have some kind of paperwork before they can even get into the warehouse. Okay, and then they, they show the ID to one of your people here. All right, once they get through the double doors here, okay, and they've shown their papers, 
one of our people will be here. We're calling that person a caller. The preparation of Building 53 is something that has entailed a great deal of planning as we had to determine how we would distribute as well as prepare and check out in excess of 2,000 machines in a very short period of time and get them distributed to students as soon as Apple made their announcement and we were able to then distribute the machines. This will be locked at all times, I hope. Yes. From this the inside, the, the, so yes. people can't, so people walk, can't in walk in here. Nobody will be allowed to come in this way. This will be locked here. We can only get out. Well, will somebody be on duty all time here at the distribution unit? There's supposed to be someone at the counter full time. We have a full time counter still. All right, we want to make sure that every patrol that we have, whether they're on foot or mobile, checks this rear area, since we have the railroad over here, and there's minimal population okay. walking by on the weekend. Now, this is our particularly vulnerable area right here at the loading dock. We want to make sure every patrol reports that there's any lights out or any cars parked there. There shouldn't be any cars parked there, and I want them to check the uh, loading dock. This is Unit 1. Go ahead, Base 6. We will advise the 1X that we will be returning in a few minutes. Ten four. And every mobile patrol must, absolutely must, do a patrol quite often back here because this is a deserted area, particularly on weekends. All right. All right. It was imperative that we picked a machine that would support the student both on campus, in their dorm or fraternity house or sorority house, or at their co-op assignment. This standalone nature really made Drexel very different from some of the other efforts that were being done at other universities. And we are told by numerous institutions it's much more typical of the kinds of needs which will be seen at other universities than the large tied together networks. Okay, let me show you the limited access areas. That will be the entrance for everyone. There'll be a student cluster, a student at the desk there. Okay. And just to give you some sense of orientation, here's the blueprint for the area. We're here in right. this area, which will be for students, a limited access area. And the faculty area will be back there. Over here. Mm -hmm. Boy, that doesn't look very big. Well, I think we'll be able to get probably 30 terminals or so. We'll be using mm -hmm. the wall space in both cases, right. and we'll have some uh, tables in this area. One of the biggest difficulties we've had in faculty development is that we're requiring the students to have a state-of-the-art personal computer, which is not yet on the market, which means that the faculty members won't get this machine before the students do. So we've had to, to talk about general ways of doing this. We've had to think about ways of writing software and designing software. But when we get to a certain stage, we can't implement it because we don't have the machine. And uh, this has made the whole, give the whole, given the whole project a little air of unreality. First of all, I'd like to just go over a little bit about what we do with the computer in the lab. We don't use it just as a fancy calculator. Most of the labs, we try to get the students to collect data in such a way that they can plot it a graph, which is a linear graph. And then the computer then calculates the resultant, and the students can then see whether their resultant, which they got experimentally, agrees with the resultant that they got on the computer. OK, now we're looking at the pole and zero pattern. We're seeing two poles. On the real axis, two zeros on the imaginary axis. This will have a special frequency response. Let's look at that one. Now we need to go to the main menu. And the main menu will lead us to the frequency response. You choose four. Let's choose our various definitions here. The amplitude response is here. And I hope it looks like we expected it. This is exactly what we expected with the zero at the center. Now we're back to the main menu. And let's look at the phase response. And yeah, that's pretty much what we expected it. Right now, what we've the example that we've shown is available to seniors on the prime uh, for want of other equipment. The simulation that we're going to be working on today is called reapportionment simulation. And all you have to do, you just push down the number and then hit the return key, which is on 
basically in the position where the shift is all the way up on the right. And now what's happening is it's actually reading that particular program into the computer. After you've read that, hit the return key one more time. The faculty really don't know what the machine is even going to look like. And that's been a source of, of difficulty, uh, but I think that's going to be corrected very soon. There are going to be a lot of people learning a lot in over the next few months uh, about this and what it can and can't do and how to make it do what, what faculty want them to do. I don't want to that waste all these votes by clustering it. They would the want to try to have somehow left. get this Pulls down. Away, because it won't be an available right. word anymore. Yeah. Done yeah. Why don't we start south and work north? Read right through it, and then hit 11 and then return. This program allows us to go back and negotiate. So you're going to put in things and take out things over time. Get a rough idea of how you want it to look, and then start thinking about planning better strategies than your already good strategies. Will we get a picture of how it's going to look? No. Okay. Um, I didn't do that because, from what I understand, when the new terminals come, it's going to take an entirely different avenue to do it, so I'm not doing it here. The fact that we haven't been free with information is just a difficulty in that this is a commercial product that's been introduced and we can't talk about it before it's introduced. Seniors, student handbook. Seniors, free coupon books for the semester. Free coupon book. Good. People have been blaming or holding the computer responsible for everything from depression to isolation to finally enjoying one's life and a variety of things and there really is very little evidence about what the effects of computers are and what we're doing at Drexel is attempting to understand the effects of computers by studying students before the computers come on campus and after and studying a class that will have the computer compared with a class that won't have a computer over a period of years. What year are you? Freshman? Fill this out for me, please, and have a seat over there. We're asking them about their attitudes towards computers, their attitudes towards other people, their values in general, whether or not they've had experience with computers, the sorts of things that are considered to be anxiety symptoms, stress symptoms, see whether they're affected by the computer. And in analyzing the material, we're going to have a picture of the effects of computers on males as opposed to females, on different age people, on people in different kinds of curricula, and should be able to answer some questions that a lot of us have had on the tip of our minds for quite a while. What are we talking about? Never mind, never mind. We're talking about something similar, the same graphics. Something similar? <laughs> uh, in other words, a little familiar. smaller. Don't get yeah. the options like the screen, the printer, <laughs> the keyboard. Well, I have no idea. It's got a little membrane keyboard. <laughs> okay, uh, you accept checks? <laughs> I was expecting it uh, when I very first got here, but they've been putting it off, and for a while there, I didn't think we were really going to get one. And then they had a thing about they were going to might switch to the IBM peanut. And I, that wouldn't have been too bad because the IBM Peanut's a good computer too. When we came to Drexel in the fall, they told us we would get it sometime in December, and then they kept updating it to uh, January, winter term, March, and triangle. I think it said March, and one of my recitation teachers told me it was going to be April. Yeah, that's right, April. That annoyed me because the year will be. We'll have two months left of the year. The one thing I don't like about it is that we're being taught Fortran, a really tough Fortran course, and the damn thing's going to be in Pascal. You know, it's, I don't understand that at all. I'm, I'm not familiar with the computer to begin with, and I think that we should have been taught Pascal instead of Fortran, even if it is similar. That's, that's the only regret I really have about it. It's been a long time, and I hope we get them soon, because I guess it's, it's going to help a lot in our schoolwork. What we want to do today is to answer your questions about anything uh, about the program that we can answer at this time within the limits of legally what we can say at the moment. And so I'll have to, on occasion, say no comment because we're under a very awkward situation that we still have a non-disclosure agreement with Apple Computer Company. And that limits the amount that we can say until they make their announcement. 
but I'll try to answer as many of your questions as I possibly can. When I get this computer home, I think a lot of students are probably figuring, all right, this computer's sitting in my room now. What do I do with it? How, how exactly are you going to integrate using the computer in regular classwork, regular courses? The machine is meant not to change the curriculum, but to enhance the curriculum. What steps have been taken to create a decent software library? There's nothing out for this computer yet because it hasn't been released. It is a new machine. What it is compatible with, prior, present, or future, I'm not at liberty to say at the moment because of my, my no comment problem with the non-disclosure agreement. Will there be diskettes sold in the school stores? People have been asking about that. Can I get diskettes now to be ready and whatever? To tell you about the diskettes, to tell you something about the machine, which we're not able to do. Therefore, we have made arrangements to have diskettes available that we can sell you, and they will be distributed probably through the school store. Uh, there's a legal shakiness right at the moment. Uh, we have to clarify, or through the Trek facility. Uh, one of the two. Yeah, I read in recent computer magazine that the, the Macintosh can have a seven-inch diagonal screen. That's kind of tiny, even for word processing and stuff. Is that the one we're going to have? I cannot comment, because you make two assumptions. Uh, one is that the machine that we're going to get is the Macintosh, and the machine that we have in our contract is the Apple DU. It may or may not be the same machine. I can't confirm that. Oh, okay. To identify any Got specs it. about the machine uh, would be to re reveal something about the, uh, the specific product. Now, I walked in about half an hour late. What did I miss? One of the most difficult problems, both personally as well as administratively during this period, has been the inability of myself and my staff to talk freely about the product. Apple Computer Company was concerned about making their own announcement of their own equipment, and certainly that's their prerogative. But because of the restrictions that were contractually placed upon us, we were severely limited about what we could tell faculty, students, or even other administrators. The secrecy was something that was t has been totally contrary to the traditional academic process, and yet something which we felt was worth the cost in order for the benefit of having the, the important long-term growth capacities of this exciting new machine. January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't... Last year, you may have noted the San Francisco Chronicle referred to us as Drexel University, prestigious science and technology school in Philadelphia. Yesterday, Newsweek simply wrote, Drexel University, where Macintoshes will be distributed to nearly 2,000 students. It's no longer necessary to mention the location. We're apparently on the map. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about how that came about, in case you don't know. We appointed a faculty committee representing every college, and they wrote out their RFP. They picked the machine they wanted. They picked the machine that corresponded best to their RFP, and they picked the Apple's machine. But we think this is a very good deal for our freshmen. Uh, they will get this thing for uh, very modest price. The, the, the price to the students and, and to those members of faculty who seek to buy one will be $1,000 plus the sales tax, a little insurance coverage if they want it. But uh, now who lifts up the door to show everybody what it is? This is the Apple Macintosh right here. Weighs about 20 pounds. The programs are stored on a three and a half inch disc. Probably the easiest way for you to learn about the Apple Macintosh is to read about it. There are several things that you should get before you leave. One of them is volume one, number four of the Drexel Micro News. It's just like and teaching a young student how to drive a car. Yeah. He doesn't have to know how to design a car. Right when he or she oh, learns the when they're young, he's a very visual. and if they learn everything goes good, they're likely to be much safer, and, uh, better uh, drivers. Is Drexel starting a trend here today? We think we've already started a trend. There are 20. This is really what's going to give the versatility to the machine. And each of our students will receive, with the machine, five pieces of software. The word processing and the graphics are so easy to use, you really shouldn't have any trouble. The manuals are well written. I've seen the, the manuals. Every school I know in the United States has this problem. 
either are going to go to huge mainframes or, more intelligently, we feel, you have a microcomputer, and that takes care of the needs for computational. Well, certainly who's who of colleges. He will probably be the first university this. to get yeah, uh, that's what I'll do. a large the ship. We're not the only university. The there are about maybe. 20 other universities change, in this the, Apple uh, consortium. physical and electronic checkout of the Macintosh that you see happening right now. And the Macintosh being packaged in one box essentially with a keyboard and a mouse doesn't require a, a sophisticated long checkout as a lot of other computers. And the machines have been burned in in Cupertino before they were delivered here. So we're making a big assumption that mechanically they're going to be in good shape and we're just looking for problems that occurred in shipment because of uh, temperature extremes or because of uh, movement. So we're doing a very superficial checkout just to make sure the components are in the box that are supposed to be in the box, make sure that there are basic movements, keyboard movements, mouse movements, that the power's on, the screen looks right. And also through this whole process, each workstation, there's a member of the comptroller staff verifying the serial numbers of the three components and so that during student distribution, there is a no uh, mix-up as far as that's concerned. Our production team has been fabulous. We originally planned for about 180 units an hour. Due to human error, we figured it would be only about 100 an hour. And in reality, it turns out we're doing about 275 an hour. Uh, we did the whole first three truckloads in the first day, and I think we'll finish the second two today. Our checkout time is going to be way ahead of schedule. And then we pack everything back up and ins insert the uh, MacWrite, MacPaint software package in the box. That's the last step. 
and then it's packaged and sent off. If we didn't go through this process, we'd be receiving a number of students back who had missing components. There was nothing wrong with the machine, but it just wasn't packed when the uh, factory packed everything. Take that down there and they'll give you a mic over here. Welcome to the There's a little book in here. Make sure you read it. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, there's a couple little books. All right. Inside the machine itself, your software package for your writing and your graffiti kit, your keyboard, your mouse. Okay. machine itself. Books to be read first, please. Your power cord, some instructional disc, and an instructional cassette. Listen to it when you're going through the journaling, especially if you haven't used a machine. It'll make it a lot easier. Okay, it'll fill in a lot of blanks and questions. Inside, you have a CPU, a keyboard, a mouse, you have a power cord. We have to check. since we last met. We had finals. I hope everyone studied and didn't play with their Macintoshes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't say I did that, but uh, we did get a lot of work done. We've gotten a discount from my Goldbergs. They're an Army-Navy store. And if we buy at least two dozen bags, they're not the standard Apple carrying cases, mind you. They're a deluxe ski boot bag. If we buy at least two dozen, we'll get 10% off. And they retail for $25. Now, the Apple Macintosh bag is $100 retail, but, you know, $25 versus $100 is a big savings, you know, $75 savings. The more people we have buying these products, the more of a discount we're probably going to get from the store owners. A programming group got together and we started working on programs. Uh, if you notice with your Macintosh, MacWrite, and MacPaint, they communicate with each other very nicely. We really want to write programs that are very compatible, very easy to use and uh, have a good operating environment so that a student can use any of our programs and feel comfortable with them. So if you are thinking of an application, uh, let us know about it. We'll keep it in confidence. We're not going to steal the idea from you or anything, but we'll take it to the faculty and see what support we can get you from them. Because uh, you may be able to program, but the faculty has a lot of teaching and education experience that they can give you to help you write your program even better. Did you look for the painting? The Queen Guinevere. Now that was a popular subject among the pre raphaelites See if you can find a mention of this painting, but spend most of your time personally reacting to the painting. In light of these three points, why do you think 
Morris chose the subject matter. We're not trying to make computer experts out of either the faculty or the students, although the fact is I suspect the students are pretty expert. I would guess 75% of them come in with a, a fair level of computer competence. What we're going to do is meld the students' computer competence and the faculty's knowledge of the subject and get a better product than we ever would have before, I think. That, to me, is what the secret's going to be. I saved up through 14. Oh, I you want to save all the documents? Yeah, I want to save everything, but if I don't have to save the first, do I have to save the... Oh, yeah, it'll, the, it'll save over. At the so time, everything. students will, in fact, be teaching faculty. How will the student react? How will the faculty react? And this entire microcomputer program has shown that the interaction between faculty and student can happen, and it's happening in a very, very positive way. But you're not the expert anymore. At least when you went in there for the first couple of times, there were students in there that knew a lot more about it than I did. I think at first it was a bit, I don't know if scary is the word. You know, I don't think anybody likes overcoming the inertia. You've been doing it this way for a number of years but I thought once you got into it the thing I told you which I found interesting was the play aspect and maybe that's not the right word but there's just oh, tickling that information out of the machine it, it's fun now was it in fact fun for maybe 50 percent of the uh, faculty and for the other 50 percent was a, a very traumatic experience and Donna you probably have uh, some input as far as that's concerned I think that getting them in the room was the first big step but I think that once they started they found the same things that the students later found that it was really enjoyable and that it was a very efficient way for them to do research we have a particular faculty member who I can't mention his name who was horrified at sitting down at a, a terminal he's not sitting and at this table no he's not <laughs> Maybe under the table. <laughs> well, anyway, he was absolutely horrified, and he kept on apologizing for not having the expertise and whatnot. But guess what? He is the gentleman that I see more often than anybody else from humanities in the faculty access cluster now. And he's really getting involved. And he had no problems with getting instruction from my staff, which was... I thought uh, amazing because he had no experience whatsoever in dealing with computers and he was very, very nervous about it. I think when we did the, when we did the faculty training sessions and we were talking about it in the abstract, we didn't have a terminal there, we couldn't show people, people got real scared. You know, I showed them printouts of, of uh, searches and things and people who hadn't worked at a computer, I think, were nervous. But when those people sat down and did a search, by, by the end of a 15-minute session, most of the people I worked with, I don't know if this was your experience, sort of said, oh, gee, this is sort of neat. Come back again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is your system disk. Okay. That has the um, software that tells it how to be a word processor. Oh, okay. Okay. So the first thing you do is you, you put it in, nope, wrong, um, this side in, silver side up, label side towards you, that's how you remember. So put, push it in and then reach around the back right around this, this side and uh, turn it on there you go and watch it'll come up you'll get a little smiling computer that'll tell you you've done it right okay <laughs> oh yeah now how long do i have to wait for something uh, to happen? not too long you're left-handed yeah this is going to be hard for me to get used to because okay. i'm used to oh, you this way but the mouse this, on this the mouse hand. Have you ever used a mouse before? With a Lisa. Okay, so yeah. you know a little bit. Mostly for us, it's a matter of constantly assuring the faculty that they're not getting over their heads, that they're not getting graded on how well they do it. What's today's date? March 2nd. <laughs> that what we're asking them to do is take an open mind to using a new tool. Oh, no, don't do that. Oh, what did I do? You inserted a space. There. Okay. Okay, okay. so, so I click, just click, click it. there. Oh, see? that's fantastic. Yeah. To see how it can enhance what they already do. We want to go into MacWrite because we're going to be writing, working on a document. So press twice on that. But this would be the centering option. So, right, now just press on that. All right, now you're set. Your right-hand margin is okay. Is that your centering? You're yes. done with that? Yes. Okay, now go back to format and add a ruler. Insert ruler. Uh, where the, here it is. Right. 
Good. Have you got this right yet? You have yeah. double space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what if I want to now put an extra space? What I would do would be move the cursor up to here. And a return. Is that right? Yeah. Now you can start typing right there. Mm -hmm. uh, the this is the McWrite, which is already on my disk. It's the program that allows you to word process. We're going to take a piece of paper off of McWrite, and we're going to start a new page so that you can learn to type on to it. Are you going to tell me what to put on it? No, you have to think of your own. <laughs> You don't know how much stress you're putting on me. Oh, be creative. They gave us an overhead projector, and uh, this is the way you'll find that I will normally teach accounting one. Today we have an added attraction with the advent of the micro projector. We had people in accounting who'd never really worked with a computer ever before. We had a man about to retire who became the ultimate computer buff and hacker and really went berserk almost, uh, developing things for students to do. And it was he who told me that he'd been teaching introduction to accounting for 35 years. And he now was for the first time asking the same question that he'd asked the first year, which is, I know what I want to say, how am I going to get it across? If we are using the Macintosh for presentation, the room will have to be this dark. And I'm wondering, number one, can you see the screen? And number two, if we douse that light, please, can you sit there and take notes of any type? No. How many people preferred uh, the Macintosh video presentation for the work in the classroom? May I see hands? How many people prefer that I use the overhead? So you have the lights. OK, thanks for your indulgence. I have a mixed bag as to which you like best, so I'll probably do both as I go through the term. I like you doing it. <laughs> well, I still want this to prove to everybody on the faculty. If you can do it. A 65-year-old can do it. Anybody can do it. The first thing you have to do is deal with the faculty and the faculty's concerns. It's simply not going to work as a part of a curriculum unless the faculty is absolutely convinced that it can be made to work. And so you must engage first in faculty development. I think that's the most essential thing. After you've had initial faculty development, then you can start to talk about the real use of the microcomputer in classes. And by the real use, I mean something more significant than the use of the micro as a word processor. Systems theory is a very important curriculum item in engineering education, especially in electrical engineering, and concepts are analytical. Therefore, it's very difficult to teach. Computer-aided instruction is a tool to supplement the in-class theory that we're teaching. Our goal is to use the Macintosh as a tool to make it available early on to sophomores for individualized learning and for uh, to supplement in-class teaching and then be ahead of everybody else, I guess. What I have in mind is to have the student develop the computer software so that they could do a whole host of problems in the one area and as a result of that learn about the effect of, say, concrete strength or uh, steel strength or the aspect ratio of the beam or, or some other variable and develop some judgment. Typically, the engineer gets this through practice, through long years of practice, and they can look at a problem and say, we ought to do this or that right off. And I see the computer as an excellent tool to use to, to accelerate this whole process. People's initial 
impressions of a computer tend to condition the way they think about what a computer can do for quite some time. And we found that uh, quite often people who've, who've come from the scientific and technical point of view often don't appreciate that the computer is very, very useful for people with a non-technical background. Uh, a history faculty member, for instance, who had no knowledge of the microcomputer or of computer science in any way at all before the project started, is now talking about the development of an electronic atlas uh, to be used in history courses across the curriculum of the history politics department. Uh, that shows a kind of quantum leap of the imagination from the question, what on earth am I going to do with this thing, to let me develop an electronic atlas. Uh, Mandala, generally speaking, is symmetrical, very much like a snowflake or a spiral galaxy. And this form has existed, as a matter of fact, Jung calls it an archetypical form. It seems to have always been around us. I've drawn them, I've made them in bronze, I've made them in steel, I've made them in clay, and um, this machine is a marvelous thing to use because you can duplicate or mirror shapes, and mandalas are very much involved with balance. And, you know, one always wonders when you make art uh, about the timeless quality of it and the universality of it, and it might well be that the mandala is one of the few structures or forms that is timeless uh, and is universal. The thing I really like about making these things is how they continually evolve and change as you're working on them. Really, the only limitation of this machine is in the imagination. The computer that we have now is a great organizational tool. It may not be a great visual tool. It could be <clears throat> one of the visual tools. I don't think I could name you a great visual tool other than the human being in his eyes. Man, that is the greatest. But beyond that, I can't say that the computer are another set of eyes. Uh, I'm not even sure it has better storage than my brain. Because in my brain, I can call up symbolic references without thinking about them. With the computer, I have to be a little more rational in the process. That's the problem with the tool and maybe any tool at any time for the artist. First of all, attitudinally, the artist is coming from, from somewhere and the relevance of this tool uh, uh, is, is very remote, uh, probably for most uh, art people. Michael once said something at a, uh, a seminar, he used three words that some other artist said. <laughs> Impregnation. <laughs> incubation and hallucination. I really feel that my vision is always larger than the sheet of paper that comes out. I will have to make a level of transformation to it. And so I see it much more, I don't know whether it's impregnation, maybe it's in between, somewhere of incubation, mm -hmm. all right? But the hallucination is either much, much smaller or much, much larger. You're saying it's hard to hallucinate with the Macintosh. <laughs> Something like that. And then I need a few notes. Quarter note. Maybe a couple of quarter notes. Maybe a half note. Even an eighth note. And with these, I can proceed to create my music. A research paper for my English class. I'm typing up the title page right now. When's it due? Tomorrow. <laughs> Don't wait till the last minute here, do we? <laughs> I'm a computer and electrical engineer, and this is my English final. Uh, I wonder what. So I used to wonder what the uh, intelligence is of teaching an engineer how to speak English, but helps be able to communicate with other people. Occasionally it's a nuisance. Laugh? <laughs> 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 They're looking at each other. So Pat, Thursday night is, um, <laughs> is Pledge's formal. Yeah. 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 It was supposed to be Tuesday, yeah. 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 I don't know why they canceled it. Who are they going to tell? Did you finish that paper that you were typing before? Mm -hmm. Yep. John Marinetti. Can I say hi? Yeah. They're going to... 
Yeah, okay, um, yeah. Go ahead. What's Terry McLaurin? Um, and, um, <laughs> we are hey, having a party. What was that, Melissa? What this? Um, all your discs. Right, my paint. The giving you everything. The program. Everything. You bring your system disc. And you do your system disc over and you bring your one back. Oh, right now we're studying Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky and what it is to be self and to despair. And you have the answers? No, I don't have the answers. <laughs> what are you saying? I'm basically restating a lot of what Kierkegaard has said and trying to show my professor that I understand what Kierkegaard's existentialist theories are. And I'm also talking about Dostoevsky, the underground man. There are a lot of things that tie back to Kierkegaard. He exhibits symptoms from some of the three levels of Kierkegaard's despair. And it's a rather interesting book. Where are you from? I'm from Sunnyvale, California. Why did you come to Drexel? I came to Drexel because of the engineering program and because of the opportunities to get an Apple computer. Okay, you can use press station number eight. Thank you. Uh, my major's chemical engineering, and I'm uh, finishing an English paper, last one in the term. When's it due? 22 minutes. Can you make it? <laughs> yeah, I, it'll take about 10 minutes with the class. So I'm a marketing major, and I'm finishing my English paper, too. So When's it due? 3.30. What time is it now? It's 10 <laughs> after. <laughs> Gets it done quick. Uh, my major is business administration. I'm printing out an English paper requirement that's due this afternoon at 3.30. I'm an accounting major. I'm working on a um, marketing project. What's it do? Uh, it's doing about an hour. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, about the project. Um, what it is is uh, you go through a term and you're in competition with other people in the class and you have a... Um, a mock company, and what you do is act like you're a real business on the stock exchange, and, and you know, just see how you do, you know, compared to other other people. I'm printing out the results now. It's all done with just the click of a button or the move of the mouse. It's really easy. I'm in chemical engineering, and I've used it for physics laboratories, chemistry assignments, English papers. Had a lot of use for it here. I'm an electrical engineering major, and I use a computer basically right now for writing papers in my English class, and I just did a resume on it. Multiplan. I use a multiplan for economics. It helps me think out the problems more, because I have to know what's going in, how the computer's going to separate everything. So that part helps a lot. I, I think more about the equations. I just to copy everything. I'm a major is computer science, and um, right now, I think it's great, the computers. We use them for chemistry labs, physics labs, writing our English papers. Uh, I use it a lot to write uh, papers for English. I only have one more English course, but... <laughs> uh, well, my class assignments are done on the computer. Everything has to be done. We're using it mostly for classes, like they're giving us programs, and then we have to punch in all the data on the programs. For physics? Yeah. Right now, we're not really programming or anything. I think the only drawback on a computer is the uh, single disk drive and the constant uh, switching of the disk back and forth. But other than that, it doesn't seem like much of a problem anywhere else. In the beginning of the year, I was really disappointed. I thought maybe it was just something for uh, to promote the school, you know, to a quick, give them a quick jump ahead with, you know, the first people to be moving to computers. But now they seem to be getting it together and we're getting some stuff, some applications. With economics, we get to use it for the English, and uh, they're updating our stuff. They're doing a good job. Um, they have the print stations set up, which is good. They're easy and they're accessible. Um, they've helped us with uh, the computer. I mean, they're integrating it. I mean, they didn't give us the computer and we're not using it. We are using it. We're using it on our courses and uh, for our, any, just about any course that we have right now. The people that don't use it are really losing out on what they purchased because the computer is great, you know, for working in business. I, I'm using it a lot now. I mean, I don't, there's not much now that to use. I mean, there isn't much out in the market, but, and I'm using it uh, three, four hours a day now. When more stuff comes out, I'll always be on it.
and there's so much you can do with it. In fact, I can't wait until I'm finished school, until finals are over, so I can really start to, to play with it a little bit. I haven't even had the time. When all is said and done, how does all this affect the student papers? My guess is that, in a way, the student papers are not... We don't judge the student papers entirely by the quality of the information that they've found. And that, that's actually part of the point. We have, we've had to be a little careful, I think, not to let the technology run away with what the course is about. The course is about, once you've found this information, doing something with it. And that hasn't changed. I think the papers are basically the same as they were before. I found that the information was more updated. I also think we're, it's probably too soon to really right. make an overall determination on the basis of the product because now that we're getting used to the technology, obviously that takes its place. We have to define the course in different ways, and maybe that's what we should be talking about. You know, this is the problem with the whole computerization of the humanities anyway. You, once you get used to the technology, the technology is no longer the issue. You're back to the issues you had before, which are, what are they supposed to be learning, you know? I think the college is better today than it was 18 months ago because of the microcomputer project. I don't mean because we've introduced the micro into the classroom. That would be very simple-minded, and maybe that would work and maybe it wouldn't. But I think we've been forced to assess what it is we really do in the classroom in order to determine whether the micro should or should not be used. That assessment, no matter what the answer is, is worth something. And I'm very pleased that we've had that assessment. If anything makes this project really a great success, it's going to be the Drexel faculty. They have, by and large, I think almost without exception, put in more time, more effort, uh, more extras, come up with more ideas than you could have ever asked them if you put limits on it. They exceeded anything we could have asked for. Will you miss Drexel? Oh, yes. I mean, 21 years, in my last 21 years, it's really my career. You walk around, you're president of Drexel, you have a certain amount of prestige, everybody's nice to you. You go downtown, everybody says, here comes Mr. Drexel. I've never solicited funds even for my church or the Boy Scouts, which are favorites of mine, because I always wanted people to think Drexel when they saw me. I feel that my wife and I have just lived Drexel, we've tried to represent Drexel, uh, we've tried to grow it a bit, but, uh, you know, you can always think of things you could do better, but you could always think of things you could do worse, too. I think, I think that uh, I'm reasonably satisfied. I'm not so egotistical to think I couldn't do better, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased. I like seeing my name in the library.